You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs. My guest today is Christian Ryan. He's part of the New Creation blog. Uh, he's an undergrad geology student out of the South Dakota School of Mines. And we're going to talk about rocks and fossils and various other archaeological or geological issues. So, Christian, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your current work and research and uh, what, what motivated you to look into it. Oh, well, basically, as you said, I'm a I'm majoring in geology at the moment. So my interest is rocks. I guess more specifically, I like sedimentary rocks because those are the ones you find fossils in. <laughs> But I was really drawn to geology from my interest in uh, paleontology, which is the study of fossils. I kind of started off as with the, an interest in animals in general, and that kind of evolved into an interest in dinosaurs specifically, and then fossils in general. And then I realized that in order to understand the fossils, I need to understand the rocks they're bound in. So here I am. <laughs> Okay. And you mentioned, you said sedimentary rocks are the rocks that fossils are found in. You know, for people that don't know, what are the major kinds of rocks out there and what is each kind like? Oh, sure. So, yeah, there are three basic types of rocks. If you want to divide those up into further subcategories, we definitely can. But to keep it simple, there's basically three. So you've got, well, like I mentioned, sedimentary rock. Those are made from sediments. And they, uh, so that can be sand, shale, or, you know, mud, things like that. And that turns into rock. The other types are metamorphic rock, which is when a pre existing rock is turned into basically, it, it's been pressurized and heated. And the third type is an igneous rock. So that's, that, that's rocks that are formed from cooled uh, molten rock. So things like lava, if it's above ground, or magma, if it's still underground. Okay. And I know this; these are like really basic, but probably weird questions. Like, what does it mean to be a rock? What constitutes when something is a rock versus not a rock? Does it have a certain density? Is it composed of certain key minerals that appear in every rock, even though every rock's different? Like, what constitutes a rock? Uh, basically, a rock can be defined as a collection of minerals. Now, you can have rocks that are made up of multiple minerals, but in a nutshell, a rock is made out of minerals. So that can be, for example, quartz. I, I kind of like quartz because uh, that is used to what sandstone is made out of a lot of times. And the individual you know, sediment grains themselves are made out of these minerals. They're really tiny, but when you combine them all together and they get cemented and hardened, they can form these really large formations and deposits. Okay. Is there any difference between a rock and a stone? Uh, not really. It's just kind of your preference. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's focus a little bit on sedimentary rocks. So what's the, you know, a sample process of how one forms? What does it go through to, to become a sedimentary rock? Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there, there's a couple ways to form sedimentary rock, but I'll, I'll keep it kind of general. Uh, so like I mentioned before, sedimentary rocks are formed from pre-existing sediments that are hardened and cemented together. So generally, a sedimentary rock, before it's a sedimentary rock, uh, will start off as sediment that's eroded from a pre-existing rock. For example, if we're on a mountaintop, those, those are really good places for erosion because they're really elevated and exposed. So you have things like wind and, and water from, from rain that will erode the rocks. If you're in a river, that, that wa the water in the river can cause erosion as well. And those sediments get transported to a usually a basin. So wherever those, those are low-lying areas where sediment will collect. And depending on your conditions will determine exactly how long it takes for those sediments to turn into rock. But in a nutshell, what needs to happen is the sediment needs to lose all or most of its water and the sediment grains themselves need to be compacted together. And then there's a natural cement that keeps them combined into one unit and 
and you've got yourself a rock. Okay. But I thought of a bad joke, you know, how do you know a geologist agrees with you? They'll say my sentiments exactly. <laughs> Very bad joke. Anyway, okay. I can take that back to your, back to your department. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, you know, I know there's debates, uh, I guess secular scientists say that, um, you know, rocks take uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of years to form. But from a, a, a theistic perspective or a, a perspective of faith, what have you observed? Like the sedimentary rocks, are they formed quickly? Do they have to be formed quickly? You know, what kind of events would, would form them? Well, uh, I guess it really depends, Like kind of like I said earlier, on your on the specific conditions, and those can vary. But uh, under the right conditions, sediment can form quickly. Uh, let's see. There's, um, oh gosh, this is a really good example. I was just trying to think of it. <laughs> well, okay. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. So a lot of times on uh, beaches, you'll have those, you'll have those necessary conditions for the sediment to be dewatered and solidify. So you get things like beach rock. That, that's an example of the really quick forming rock. Oh, and a quick forming meaning like how fast? Oh, I, I don't have like an exact a time oh, estimate. Like ballpark. Ball like, you know, can it happen in days, weeks, years? Thousands? Oh, yeah, like day, day, days or weeks. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And what, what constitutes a, a, a rock? Again, do they do most rocks share a certain set of, you know, of minerals that, that compose like most of their bulk? And then there's other ones that are small bits of it that make it different? Or are there several different kinds of major substrates that constitute rocks? Rocks can be made out of a variety of different types of materials uh we're specifically dealing with sedimentary rocks which is like i said my my main interest it can vary sometimes they'll be made out of just one mineral there are deposits for example of sandstone in my area here in south dakota we have just layer upon layer of sandstone and mostly those particular layers that i've that i've seen in person mostly made out of quartz the the, the mineral quartz uh, but you also have different types of rocks called uh, conglomerates. Those are when multiple pre-existing rocks that were not eroded to the point of becoming little tiny sediment grains, they get uh, clustered together and they form. They themselves form a new rock. They can either be uh, cemented together into what we call a matrix, which, which is the uh, sediment grains themselves, or depending on your situation, they could be uh, just those rocks themselves that get that turn into a conglomerate. <laughs> okay. So what is your undergrad? I don't think you're going for your thesis yet, but not yet. <laughs> okay. What well what are your what are your interests? What have been like areas that maybe you've been doing self study in or focus or concentration in? What questions are you trying to answer? Well, for me as a younger creationist, I'm interested in understanding the geologic record from a biblical perspective. So a really big emphasis for me is being able to piece together Earth's history from the rocks and correlating that with the record of history recorded in the early chapters of Genesis. So if you kind of intuitively, a, a lot of times people like to think, oh, you know, rocks, if from a younger creationist perspective, all the rocks and fossils were formed during the flood. Um, I think that really does a disservice to what we have recorded in the text in scripture, because we actually, if, if, you t if you look really closely at, at scripture, you'll find that there are different periods of time during which rocks can form. Obviously, like I mentioned, there's the flood, but within the flood, you have different phases, right? You have the beginning of the flood when the it's, when it's recorded, the fountains of the great deep burst forth or broken up. That's probably describing geologic activity right there. So that's going to lead different types of evidence behind than say the middle of the flood or the end of the flood. And of course, you've also got uh, the post-flood times. We still have, like, like I mentioned before, we have rocks forming today. So therefore we would expect some of the geologic rock record to have formed after the flood. And there's creation week rock as well. When God created Adam and Eve and the animals and the plants. Oh, how, were... how do you tell uh, creation week rocks from flood rocks? Or post-flood rocks? Oh, good question. So basically, there's a few different ways of approaching those types of questions. I like to use a, kind of an approach called suites of criteria. So instead of looking at, you know, one or two lines of evidence, 
to kind of say, okay, this is blood, this is not blood. I like to use an entire set of evidences because we have some expectations we would expect to find in blood rocks versus creation week or post blood rocks. If it's a creation week rock, uh, since rock would have been formed before God made the animals and the plants and humans, I would expect it to not have any fossils of those things contained within it versus something during the flood. Since the flood was global, I would expect at least some of those deposits to cover large portions of the planet. And since there were animals and plants around at that time, I would expect them to have fossils. Okay. But again, so pre-flood rocks, you would expect no fossils in them. And like, how would they have been different than the flood rocks or again, post-flood rocks? So I think, I think it kind of depends. So if we're talking pre-flood rocks, I think it's important to distinguish creation week rocks from any rocks formed between creation and the flood. Because those creation week rocks, kind of like what I said, they would have been formed probably between days one and the early part of day three of creation before land animals and plant, before animals and plants and humans were created. So no fossils there. After that point and up until the flood, most young earth geologists don't think that there was a whole lot of geologic activity happening at that time. And an important condition, and a, a, an important thing to have in order to form a fossil is the organism needs to be very quickly before it can get eaten by scavengers or rot. And since there's not a whole lot of geologic activity before the flood, we think there's probably not going to be too many fossils and any that do form were probably they probably would have been eroded by the initial action of the flood versus after the flood we kind of would expect the world to be recovering so if you think about modern earthquakes we have the initial earthquake itself but we'll have aftershocks that can last you know minutes days hours sometimes even weeks after the initial earthquake because the earth is still resettling from that big event so after the largest catastrophe of all time it definitely took earth some it took earth a period of time to reach equilibrium again and during that time as the earth's settling down we have regional or localized uh, geologic activity during which animals and plants can be buried and fossilized okay so is it really necessary i mean it sounds like it's necessary for like extreme conditions to be present for a fossil to form at all is that the case? Yes. Yeah. If if you have a fossil, that means something unusual has happened because the general rule of nature is when an organism dies, God has created a very efficient system of that eliminates those deceased organisms from the ecosystem and it returns the nutrients back so it can get recycled and all that. So when we do find a fossil, that means something interrupted the, that natural process. Usually it's the animal gets buried. That can happen during a flood, for example, or sometimes we find fossils in caves. Caves are really good places to preserve fossils because they're they're isolated environments. So, you know, the scavengers can't get to them and decay processes are less effective there. And you also can form fossils in places like tar pits. Those, al those also act as kind of ways to conceal the organisms. So, yeah, there's, there's a number of different ways to preserve a fossil. But when you find a fossil, you know something unusual has happened. Okay. So, well, another question actually in terms of uh, fossil formation. So I, I guess, what are the earliest fossils of people that have been found? Or, you know, I, I, I guess people have found skeletons and all that stuff, but uh, people found actual like fossilized people. Yeah. So the fossil record of humans starts actually pretty late, geologically speaking. Uh, so if you can think about the geologic record, kind of like a stack of pancakes the oldest layers are toward the bottom the youngest ones are toward the top humans don't show up until the very top of that stack in layers that we would typically call uh, upper neogene and pleistocene layers okay and humans are missing from the rest of the geologic record which is a really interesting phenomenon for us as young earth gracious i think given that from a biblical perspective humans have been around since day six of creation week, right? So a lot of that might have to do with the distribution and population size of humans before the flood. There's an, a number of creation scientists have suggested that if they weren't super common, then that would have reduced their chances of being fossilized before that point. And when they start showing up in the fossil record, we think that's uh, post-flood layers. So these are you know, layers that are formed after the flood probably as humans are spreading around the earth and repopulating it. 
Well, I guess, yeah, I guess there's several scientists I've heard say that there's not appear to be any flood time human fossils. Is that accurate? And if so, uh, why, why do you believe that is? So, yeah, I, I do think you're right. Yeah, I don't think we find any, any human remains or artifacts from the flood. And I think probably a big component of that is just simply that they were destroyed. When a lot of times when people think about the fossil record, they think that, oh, it just because an organism is alive at a certain time in a certain place, it's automatically going to be fossilized. But I don't think that's really accurate because we have instances where fossils actually show up in unexpected places in the geologic record. One of my favorite examples is the coelacanth, which is a type of uh, deep sea fish. For a long time, we only knew about them from fossils that had been found with dinosaurs. So people thought that that's when they went extinct and disappeared until the 1930s when we started finding coelacanths in the Indian Ocean. So why didn't they show up in the fossil record? Clearly, they've been alive all this time since their fossil record in. So what's the deal with that? Well, the the deal is coelacanths are relatively rare and they live in isolated pockets of the world. So even if any of their remains from modern coelacanth populations were fossilized, we probably would not be able to access them just because they're on the bottom of the ocean. And then to kind of apply that to fossil humans, if if uh, humans before the flood were not globally distributed and if their population wasn't that large, there, there's a pretty good reason to think that we would not find their fossils. Oh, what was the global population estimated to be at flood time at the beginning? So there's been a number of different estimates, some ranging into the millions or billions. Uh, part of the difficulty is we just don't know how many children people were having. Because if we turn to scripture, it usually only tells us about one child, the one that continues the lineage. (laughs) So it it doesn't list all of their siblings and how many children their siblings had, how many grandchildren their siblings had, and so on. So we don't really have a whole lot of details to go on. But based on their absence from blood rocks, I think it's pretty is I think it's a pretty good indication that humans weren't widely distributed or very common before the flood. Hmm. So, what, I mean, what are what are some estimates that you've heard of the human population in ballpark? Let's see. Just kind of as a standard population group, probably hundreds of millions to billions of individuals living before the flood as like a max. So when, when people look at, you know, human fossils that are around, they would be all post-flood, right? Yes. Yeah. We strictly find human artifacts and fossils in post-flood context. So, for example, we find a lot of human remains in caves, which is, you know, why a lot of them are called cavemen. And those caves are carved into rocks that we think were formed during the flood. We think they were formed during the flood because the rocks that these caves are carved into are often filled with like marine sediments and marine fossils that are very extensive and very thick. And they're they're on the continent. So that means they were formed at a time when the ocean levels were much higher and over the continents, which seems pretty suggestive of the flood. And since these caves are carved into those, they must have been formed after, which means anything venturing or getting washed into those caves must have been after as well. Okay. I mean, but these, is that really a fossil or is that just human remains found in a cave? Yeah. So the definition of a fossil is kind of, there's kind of a fuzzy definition for, for fossils. Generally speaking, a fossil is a once living organism or the remains of it that have been preserved. So technic, uh, I guess, generally speaking, if an organism, if we have the preserved remains of an organism that lived, uh, let's say before the end of the ice age, that's generally called a fossil. But sometimes people will, when, when they're referring to fossils, they're specifically referring to permineralization, which is when the, the actual you know, organism itself or where was left of it is changed from the original organic material to minerals. Oh, you mean all the organic material has been replaced by minerals? Yes. What, is it, that's like what happens with petrified wood, right? Yes, yes, exactly. What about with animals? What What is it called when that happens? That's a fossil, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. And th- that process is usually called permineralization. Okay. I mean, oh, I guess I've heard there's some dinosaur fossils, though, that do have tissue in them still, and some that are just rock. Is that accurate? 
Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the reason why it's kind of hard to define fossils <laughs> because there's a lot of, depending on the type of conditions, the boss that the organism was preserved in, sometimes you can get, sometimes they will be completely permineralized. Other times there's original organic material and sometimes it's still soft and stretchy like it was in life almost. Well, what do human fossils tend to look like? And what does that tell you about what might have happened during the flood? You know, are human fossils typically different from sea creature fossils or other land animal fossils? Um, generally not because our, our biology is pretty, it's, you know, the standard mammal biology. We, we have a mammal's body. So generally speaking, we fossilize in the same way. Oh, I mean, so, all right. So in human fossils, have we found some that are completely permineralized or do they tend to be the, you know, still the soft, squishy parts remain? Yeah. Like, like with other animals, it varies. Uh, sometimes. We are sometimes our remains are completely permineralized. Other times, there's still organic material left. So All right, but you don't you don't see way. anything anything telling about human fossils that would give you a clue as to what happened. Is there's, there's there appears to be nothing unique about them versus fossils of other animals? Not not in terms of their actual remains. A lot of times, uh, it's I guess their geological or in some cases archaeological context that kind of determined that can kind of tell us a lot about how they died uh for example with a lot of fossil humans we find them in kind of like a burial position they'll be they'll be laid in a pit sometimes they'll be arranged in a like a cradle position <laughs> and so that's indicative that they were buried by probably family members or other members of their clan okay so what, I mean, if catastrophic events are the best ways, it seems like, for fossils to be created, what do uh, post-flood fossils look like? Are they usually, you know, not whole skeletons? Are they, you know, lower quality? Are they crappier with maybe one or two bones and the rest are scattered because you didn't have, let's say, rapid burial for the most of them? You know, it, it really depends. There's a lot of different types of geologic processes happening after the flood, there's this really, really fascinating site actually in Nebraska. It's called Ashfall Fossil Beds. And there are hundreds of rhinoceros and horses and other mammals that were buried by volcanic ash. They think, uh, scientists think that they were suffocated uh, by the ash and they pretty much just died where they were. <laughs> and so those fossils are very, very well preserved. In other cases, we find uh, fossils of once living post flood organisms that are disarticulated. And by that, I mean the bones of the skeleton have all come apart. And that's usually indicative that they weren't buried as quickly, but still quickly enough to be preserved. Hmm. Okay. Well, I was thinking also the city of Pompeii, as you were talking, because I guess mm -hmm. those people recovered an ash. So essentially, those people are fossils, right? Technically, yes. We, we don't usually call them fossils, given that they're only, you know, couple thousand years old rather than like right after the end of the ice age but yeah technically yes they are fossils <laughs> well i mean from there you know their demise was very quick and essentially i guess like you said they were fossilized uh, what could be learned from studying pompeii for instance about how you know that process was able to create these fossils so quickly of people well just like during pompeii and with volcanic eruptions in more recent times we have evidence of volcanic eruptions in the past in many t in many cases they were actually larger than our modern eruptions which is kind of scary to think about that that kind of pulls into that that post-flood recovery i was talking about earlier and so by studying how these more recent volcanic eruptions occurred and how they preserved organisms we can then extrapolate that back to uh, more ancient organisms and see how they were buried and how they were preserved yeah, I mean, I you know, I know you can travel all over the place and see all this stuff, but I wonder if it'd be really cool if you're able to go to Pompeii if they're still like any active digging and see these things in person. It might be really interesting to contrast that to what you've learned and to see it in person for real. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I I haven't haven't gotten the chance to go over there yet, but it's on my bucket list one day. <laughs> all right. Have you done much field work with geology? Like, I guess I'm thinking more archaeology, digging stuff up. But you know, have you? How much of a field work is a component of what you do? So I haven't done a whole lot of field work yet, but I have started taking field geology classes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to applying what I've been reading and 
you know, learning from lectures and presentations and actually, you know, seeing it for myself in the field. So far, it's been a really interesting experience, just being able to take a look at the rocks for myself and try and determine how they were formed and what processes were at play. It's just it's all really fascinating. Yeah. What kind of questions do you want to answer and eventually with uh, your own research? Well, actually, I'm in the I'm currently in the process of working on an abstract for the Origins Conference, which is going to take place next year. The, the exact date hasn't been decided yet, so stay tuned for that. But I'm interested in, kind of to pull back from what I mentioned earlier, correlating the geologic record with the biblical record. And one of the most important correlations I think that can be made is the flood itself. And since scripture records the flood is at least at one point during its duration, it com- water was completely covering the whole planet. I expect to find evidence of that recorded in the rocks as well. And I think there's a few places on the geologic record where I think we can make a pretty good case for at least near global, if not global, uh, submersion. Right. Well, what would be involved in, in making that case? Like, what are some of the, the critical elements you think? Well, since the global flood involved the coverage of the land masses by the ocean, I would expect to find evidence of marine deposits and fossils on the continents instead of in the ocean basins, which is, you know, where obviously where it is today. And I think we find a lot of evidence for that all around the world. One of my personal favorite examples is right here in South Dakota, we have these chalk deposits and chalk is a type of limestone. So it's, you, you can form limestone in a number of different ways, but generally speaking, it's formed by tiny uh, microscopic organisms, think like phytoplankton, and those sink to the bottom of the uh, whatever water body we're speaking of, in this case, the ocean, and they accumulate there and form these very extensive deposits. And we find these chalk deposits across much of North America, over South America, Europe, uh, Europe, Europe is actually where they were first identified from a, you know, a geologic mindset, but yeah, they also occur in Africa, Australia, pretty much everywhere in the world. <laughs> so, okay. What, what are these chart deposits tell you? Like what's unique about them? Well, uh, for one thing, they tell us that ocean levels at the time they were forming were much, much, much higher than they are today. If you've heard of the, uh, white cliffs of Dover, that's, that's one really popular site where we can actually see these chalk deposits exposed. And the fact that they're so extensive on the continents, I think, is really suggestive that the entire world at that time was covered by water, or at least nearly so. Any any other you know questions that you think, uh, uh, wow, if, if someone could answer this to shed light on it, that would be amazing. You know, Is there anything that uh, maybe you'd consider it super aspirational, but something that you'd like to figure out through research? Yeah, actually, I would like to better understand the order of the fossil record and the the order in which they appear in the in the rocks all over the earth. Because whenever we find fossils that are not you know, arranged randomly, they occur in a very predictable order along with the rocks that they're found in. And I think that's really good evidence for the global flood, but there's that still leaves a lot of questions for us. Exactly. How is that order assembled? Why do we find, for example, we, we only find trilobites below dinosaurs and we never find large mammals with dinosaurs. And so there's definitely some interesting questions there for us as generic creationists that I, I think we, we've we started to answer. But I think if we do some more work, we can come up with a more comprehensive understanding of what's going on here. Well, what would be your guess? Why do you think that large animals were not found with uh, dinosaurs or why would try that but maybe seems like an easier answer i don't know they're a lot smaller they're tiny in comparison uh they hang out in other niches uh maybe they're a lot more mobile uh who knows but what, what would be your speculation on why well i think in terms of like a really big first order explanation for how we might explain the order of the fossil record i think they wouldn't have all formed at exactly the same time. Like I'd mentioned before, some fossils and rock layers were formed after the flood. So obviously I wouldn't expect to find those, bur- I wouldn't expect to find those organisms buried with the ones that were buried during the flood. And I guess I'll kind of briefly summarize the geologic record here for context. In terms of animal fossils, which is 
usually what I'm interested in. Uh, we can divide the animal fossil record into three major portions. That would be from oldest to youngest, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Your dinosaurs are going to be found in the Mesozoic layers. Most of your modern types of mammals and birds are going to be found in the Cenozoic. Uh, humans are actually found toward the top of the Cenozoic, by the way. And the Paleozoics characterized by a lot of really strange animals that we really don't have today. Most of them are marine, but you do find some more lands leaning organisms as well. So, you know, you've got your trilobites, you have a very wide variety of fish, like the placodonts, for example. Uh, you might've heard of Dunkleosteus. That's one of the types of placoderms rather that we have preserved in the fossil record of the Paleozoic. And you've also got a number of really weird so we used to call them mammal-like reptiles, but nowadays they're called non-mammalian synapsids. You might be familiar with uh, Dimetrodon. It's a sailback lizard-looking creature, even though it's... Yeah, you know, like Stegosaurus, but kind of with a sail, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of. And it would have been carnivorous. And even though it looks kind of like a reptile, it actually had more in common with uh, mammals like us than actual reptiles. So that's, that's another really weird thing. And so... According to the most young archaeologists, and I would agree, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic is most is largely what's forming during the flood, we think, with the Cenozoic forming after the flood for the most part. So anything we find in the Cenozoic, I would not expect to find buried with the Paleozoic and Mesozoic life forms. So that partially answers that part of the question. Regarding Paleozoic and Mesozoic, though, I think a lot of that has to do with the order of burial during the flood. Since the flood started in the oceans, we would expect to find a lot of those marine organisms getting buried first before the floodwaters encroach the land and start burying land animals. So I think that explains kind of the general order. Again, there are still open questions and plenty of more areas for research, which I'm really looking to get into. Well, how much time would have passed between the layers from a young earth creationist point of view? Well, again, that kind of depends on what time period we're talking about here there this is an area of ongoing research there's not a whole lot of consensus on exactly how much time but regarding the cenozoic we're probably looking at anywhere from a few centuries to maybe a millennia or two that'll depend on which textual variants you're using to uh, which textual variants of scripture you're using to determine how much time occurred between the flood and Abraham's time. Because uh, about around uh, Abraham's time, it seems like the world of organisms, animals and plants is pretty modern for the most part. You know, you have your lions, your your wolves, your your domesticated camels and donkeys and all that. And then those, these, these are the types of animals that you typically associate with modern times. So the world seems pretty, the biological world seems pretty modern at that time. And... If we're talking about the Paleozoic and Mesozoic layers, that will also that, that kind of depends on exactly what phase of the flood they're being formed in. Uh, but we're probably talking about days, weeks, or months to form the entire Paleozoic and Mesozoic record. Oh, so it'll be a very short time between the different. But what would create that division in the fossil record if there was such a short time between, and they're so different, the new layers? And how, how stark is the cutoff between one layer and another? Is it like, you know, just a perfect cut? Or is it is there some mixing in the boundaries of the different layers? So generally speaking, the order is very consistent. We do find instances where we find... Where, there are instances where we find fossils where we don't expect to find them. But generally speaking, if we're correct that the Paleozoic and Mesozoic were formed during the flood, what's likely happening is the flood is sampling from different ecological communities that existed before the flood. So our modern world is a little bit different considering that we're, you know, we've recovered from the flood per se, but kind of, if you look around the world today, we can see that animals and plants generally don't have global distribution. They tend to be found in certain parts of the world. So that's kind of what we think was happening before the flood as well. If God created different ecological communities, each with their own unique sets of plants and animals, they would have been living with those sets of plants and animals until the time of the flood, during which entire ecological communities would have been destroyed, they would have been swept away, transported, and buried where we currently find them. 
on top of each other in a vertical succession as the flood uh, proceeds. Right, but what happens at the very boundaries of the Cenozoic versus the Paleozoic? What do those boundaries look like? How clean are they? You know, are they messy looking? Well, it kind of depends on which part of the fossil record we're looking at. There are certain parts, there, there are certain points in the fossil record where there's almost a complete turnover where the animals in the animals and plants in the lower layer are completely swapped out from ones in the upper layers. Uh, I guess one of the starkest examples of that is called the Permian Triassic boundary. And at that point, around uh, 96% of organisms in the Permian are gone in the Triassic. That's, that's a pretty stark difference. So from a young earth perspective, one way to think about that is where we have one ecological community that is destroyed and then another one is buried on top of it, therefore preserving a very stark contrast between those two parts of the geologic record. In other cases, we do find some crossover and that also might play into the arrangement of these ecological communities before the flood and how the flood buried them. But I don't think we have a really firm answer on exactly what's going on there yet for the most part. Okay. Well, very good, Christian. I know that, you know, you're not, I guess you're not publishing yet, but you undoubtedly will be in the in their future. What's the best place for listeners to find out more about your work? Uh, is there anywhere they can go right now or they're just going to have to wait and see? Uh, yeah, I would just recommend sending folks to the uh, New Creation blog. I'm a regular writer there. And most of the time I am summarizing those really long technical research papers that nobody wants to read and transforming them into something that's a bit more compact and easier to digest. So definitely head over there to see some of our recent work. All right, that's excellent. Well, Christian, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 